Amen. Well, I don't know about you, that communion was awesome, amen. And thank you for everyone who shared so powerfully and vulnerably, and it was so touching to see the love and what the cross can do in our relationships, amen. And uh, as we kind of close the service today, we're going to talk, of course, about the church, amen. And we're going to go to Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. And if you're visiting with us, we have a series we do called the First Principles Bible Studies. And each study really teaches someone how to have a relationship with God. And we do Bible studies on things like seeking God and discipleship and the Word of God and the Kingdom of God. And the last one in the series is called the Church Study. Amen. And I thought it would be appropriate for us to do that today as the church is called in the Bible or hinted at it being the mother, if you're with me right here, amen, it's the bride of Christ, amen. And so what we're going to do is we're going to study out our church Bible study today. I find this is the study that's least done because it's at the end and a lot of people don't make it to the church study, amen. And so it's important for us to really have a deep conviction on the church, you know, Jesus is the husband to the church. And we live in a time where a lot of people want a relationship with the father, but not the bride, not the mom. And you know, if people grow up in households like this, uh, it can have a huge impact on us for negative. And yet that's kind of the Christian world out there. I got a relationship with God, uh, the church, I'm not really into that. And we read here in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Amen. You know, it talks about Jesus and how Jesus is the express image of God, and that in Christ all things hold together. Amen. You know, if you feel like your life's falling apart, get close to Jesus and all things will be held together. Amen. Amen. But he says, you know, the way he's going to really touch the world is through the church. And the Bible calls the church here in verse 18 the body of Christ. So we learn that the church is not just an organization, it's an organism. It's alive and it's active. You know, Jesus, his body is still here on earth, and for people to be saved, they still have to come in contact with Jesus Christ. And so when they come to church, you might be the only Bible they ever read, amen? You might be the only Jesus, if you will, they encounter because this is the body of Christ. A lot of times people go, well, I'm not into organized religion. And I always want to ask, are you into disorganized religion? <laughs> but, but the reality is, is that what they're saying is that maybe they've been hurt by a church in the past or they had a boring experience growing up at church or this sort of thing. And we can't allow our experiences to define what the church is, we've got to allow the Bible to define what the church is. That's the key. Now, when you think about that, the word organization actually comes from the root word where we get their words organ from. So it's actually a bodily term. And you wouldn't want a disorganized body. Because if something's not functioning right, if there's disorder in your physical body, that means you need to go to the hospital. Right. Something's wrong. And so we don't want to be a part of a church that's disorderly. We believe in strong organization in the church. But who's the head of the church in this passage? Jesus Christ. And so just as the head is Christ and the body is the church, if I want a relationship with Christ, the head, then I need to be a member of the body. Amen. And so we learn that the church is essential to Christianity. You cannot be a Christian. You know, there have been bumper stickers made years ago that said, Jesus, yes, the church, no. Is that biblical? No. no. To be a Christian is to be a part of the body of Christ. So we learn the church is essential to Christianity. Amen. Amen. We find another analogy to the church in Ephesians chapter 2. Come on, Mike. In Ephesians 2 and verse 19, Come on. the Bible says, consequently... You're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people 
and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. You know, this passage is powerful because we see that before we were Christians, we were foreigners to God. We were alien to God. We were strangers to God. And that when we got baptized, when we became Christians, the Bible says we became members of God's household. Some translations say God's family. Amen. And so when you are a member of the church, you are a member of the family of God. And you think of a household, you know, you think of the house, God's the father, amen. And of course, all of us who are members of that house, all the Christians, we're the sons and daughters of God. And that makes you my brother. That makes you my sister. In a very real way, you are being part of a family. You know, someone's last name, for example, I, you know, Joe Chapetta, right? How did Joe become a Chapetta? Did he, did he choose one? Did he get to go and look around at each family he wanted and just go, which, which one am I going to be a part of? Which one do I like? No, he was born into the family. So we need to talk about what makes someone a member of a church. Because many people teach different things. Oh, you become a member at confirmation, or you become a member when you start paying a tithe to a church, or you become a member when you've accepted Christ. What does the Bible teach? Well, we're going to come back to this passage, but let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, a few books back. And we're going to look at chapter 12 in verse 12. And we're talking about the church being a family. And in my opinion, as you're turning there, this is probably perhaps why we get a lot of persecution even as a church sometimes. Because we actually function as a family. What's your risk of dysfunction with a group that you meet with once a week and you have no relationships with during the week? There's going to be no dysfunction. But you know how it is. We all have dysfunction in our families, don't we? <laughs> you know, the, the, the people you probably have the most struggle with or the most strife with are the people that are closest to you. Because the deeper you love, the more potential there is for even hatred at times. Believe it or not, hate is not the opposite of love. Apathy is the opposite of love. It's, it's when you don't care, and that's the dangerous point. But, but when you have strong feelings of, of hurt, it's because you love them still, and, 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 and there needs to be reconciliation. Are you with me right here? And so understand that since we are the family of God, and our church is striving to practice biblical Christianity, that means we have relationships throughout the week. Are you with me right here? And, and we got to fight to be the family of Christ. And, and here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 12, it says, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Some translations say so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink, and the church said, amen. So when do you become a member of the church? When you're baptized, amen? You guys live out there? Yeah. Okay, all right. A few, few of you, I was like, did you read the same verse, amen? It's okay to engage a little bit in the service here, amen? I know it's Mother's Day and it's a holiday service, but you can still engage in the Word of God, amen? amen. Now, here's the thing. When you're baptized, that word baptizo means immersed. That's right. And so, literally, the language is making the point, yes, you're immersed in water, but you're immersed into the church as to form into that body. So it's a strong language, like, you are becoming a hand now on Christ. You are becoming a finger now on Christ, an eye on Christ. It's, it's, it's just, you're now immersed in the life of the church. And I got to ask, are you still baptized in the church? Yeah. Submerged into the life of the church. And so that's when you become a member. Not only are all your sins forgiven, not only do you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, but God sees you as an active member of his body. Amen. Yeah. Well, you know, we go to Romans chapter 6, and we review a little bit of a scripture we're familiar with from our light and darkness study in Romans 6 and verse 3. Come on. Come on. It says, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So when did Paul believe his new life started? Before baptism or after? After, when you're baptized, that's when you're born. You see, Joe became a chapetta when he was formed in his mother's womb and born. Amen? Amen. And you got to consider, the, God chose you to be a part of his church. Amen. 
The Bible says in Acts 2, 47, the Lord added to their number. So I think a lot of times we think we choose churches like we choose shoes or something, whichever one fits best. And yet the Bible teaches that God sent a disciple into your life, makes you into a disciple, and when you're baptized, you're now added to his church. You're now a member of that church, amen? amen. And there's a commitment to family. You know, every family has meetings at times and reunions and family dinners. And if you're a teenager and your family's coming together for a family meal, let's just say you don't show up, what are your parents going to do? Well, if it's my family, you know, they'd be concerned. Uh, they'd start calling, you know, friends and see if I went to someone's house, was I next door. But, you know, after 24 hours, at some point, you're allowed to file a missing person report. And a week goes by, you're now on the news. You're, you're, yeah, I mean, there's a concern yeah. because we're family. Come on. You know, there are brothers and sisters that miss church, and they don't tell anyone about it. No. Yeah. I mean, we're all going to have to miss from time to time for different things that go on and whatever. But it shows whether someone really believes we're family or not. Wow. Is there's communication in a family out of love? You know, for you, is there someone from your Bible talk that's missing from church today? Do you have a heart for them of concern? Now, again, you don't call them, where were you? You know what I mean? Because they might be in the hospital or something, amen? Like, you don't know. But you call and you say, hey, how are you doing? I really missed you today. And, and oftentimes when someone missing church, they're weak spiritually. They're weak spiritually. And so for those of you who are visiting with us, we really believe in being a true family. When we say brother or sister, these aren't just terms we, we throw around. We don't believe in a father. No priest or preacher is called a father because God's our father. Amen. And so, so far we've learned there's no head but Christ, no headquarters but heaven. And as we're going to see as we turn back to Ephesians chapter 2, no creed but the word of God. Amen. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. And go back to where we were at before, prior. And you know, I find coming into the kingdom, we were all raised differently. And for some people, we have to learn to be family. And what you learned as family growing up is not biblical family. Are you with me right here? Yeah. For a lot of us, we, we, we experience, uh, in my life, for example, there's suicide in my family. There was divorce in my family and remarriage and all these kinds of things. Uh, and so my temptation coming into the church is to feel deep rejection when someone doesn't maybe call me back. Or someone doesn't show me the attention that I feel like I need. Or you, you, ever, you ever struggled with, with feelings of like, man, I just feel like I'm not loved here. Yeah. And we all battle different things. I would put before you a lot of this stuff's actually rooted in probably how you grew up and how you perceive things. And part of what the challenge we have is to have to relearn how to be great sons and daughters to God, but also brothers and sisters to each other. Yeah. And the Bible does teach we can have spiritual parents in the church. Amen. Right. Uh, fathers in the faith, not fathers. You get what I'm saying? In the faith, uh, spiritual mothers and spiritual moms and dads. And I pray today that even on Mother's Day, you honor your spiritual moms who have brought you up in the Lord in a great way too. Amen? Amen. You know, in Ephesians 2, we find the foundation of the church in verse 20. Come on. It says this, it's built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. You know, back then in engineering, if you will, there was the, the chief cornerstone was the first stone that was laid that held the entire uh, thing together. And the Bible says Christ is the chief cornerstone. Now, what's the foundation? It's the prophets and the apostles. And what are we talking about? Are we talking about building a physical building on some dead person's bones? No. It's talking about what the prophets taught and what the apostles teach. Well, where do we find the prophets' teachings? In the Bible, right? The Old Testament, some in the New Testament, the prophets in the New Testament too. Where do we find the apostles' teachings? In the New Testament. And so the foundation is the teachings of the Old and the New Testament, and Christ holds them all together. Are you with me right here? And so the Bible functions as like the Constitution does for America. The Bible is the Constitution for the church. The difference being that we can't amend it, amen? <laughs> it's set in stone. And every kingdom has a king. Yeah. Every kingdom has a law. Every kingdom has lords that, if you're using medieval language, carry out the laws to the people and subjects. So for us as God's kingdom, who's our king? Yeah. 
Jesus. Amen. Amen. What's our law? The word of God. Amen. The law of Christ that we find in the Gospels in the New Testament. And what is the Lord's in our kingdom? Well, these would be like shepherds and evangelists and stuff. Kind of like similar in America, like the policemen. They're not above the law. They're not supposed to be. Amen. But they, 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 they carry out the law. Amen. And they execute. So our responsibility in our church, we have evangelists like Lou Jack and Kathy Martinez, evangelists and women's ministry leaders, Scott and Sandy Lundy, and Chanel and myself. Our, 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 our role, we're not above the law. We don't believe in a pope. We don't believe that, that anyone, only Christ is the head. But we are, are the police, if you will, the cops, if you will. Um, that, that are out to carry out and execute the word of God by calling people to obedience and enforcing it. Of course, the analogy only works so far because we do it with love, gentleness, patience, and all Christ-like qualities. Amen? The shepherds in the church have authority given by God to them, like the Chiapetas and the Kellys, um, and more to come. Amen? Um, that to, to carry out and feed the flock and take care of them. And so we need to understand that we are part of a family with spiritual parents that are helping to guide the flock uh, to be able to glorify Christ in a great way. And leadership's role is to create a great unity, amen? amen. But our guide, of course, then is the subjects, that's all of us, we're all subjects, we're all disciples. And our territory for this kingdom is the world to bring the gospel to all nations, amen? amen. But that only is founded on the word of God. So when we talk about what church do I need to go to? We need to go to the church that Jesus founded. Amen. Jesus said, I came to build a church that not even hell could stop in Matthew 16. Wow. And you have so many different churches out there today. This is where the word denomination comes in. Denomination is a Latin word that means name of a group. So you've got the Lutheran church. You've got the Mormon church. You've got the Baptist church. You've got the Episcopalian church. You've got the Church of England. You've got the Catholic church. You've got the Seventh-day Adventists. You've got Pentecostals. You've got et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They say there are over 12,000 different types of churches in the United States alone. So what happened? And is this what God intended? Well, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to kind of transport back to the time in the Bible and consider what denominations would you see driving down the street in the time of Rome during this time, amen? And the answer is none. <laughs> because the Bible says here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's over all and through all and in all. And the church said, amen. How many churches are there according to Paul here? One. one. And now Paul who was a leader, a missionary, is writing to the church in the city of Ephesus. And guess how many churches were in that city of Ephesus? One. Now, of course, they met in different house groups like we do, right? We're meeting all over LA this morning in different groups. All, But it was the same church. Right. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 12. Paul's now going to write a letter to the church in Rome. The same leader writing a letter to the church in Rome. Well, this shows me that the churches were not locally autonomous, meaning that they did not have the final say for their own church or practice self-governing leadership. Come on. Now, you say, what are you talking about? Well, most churches that are not Catholic or not Orthodox are locally autonomous. And this means you drive down the street. Even the Baptist church, they have like conventions and things like that. But each Baptist church makes decisions for its own church. We believe in the Bible where we're different is that the churches actually worked together to evangelize the world. And that the churches shared their money, their people, and their resources. And you're going to see as we get into it later, even had like Paul overseeing leaders that oversaw different churches. Because here's the deal. Can you be a Christian all by yourself? No. no, that'd be hard without discipling, would it not? I'd say almost impossible. And yet there are churches that operate by themselves. Could a church operate by itself? No, it's going it's to be lukewarm because the preacher has no accountability in his life. 
This is autonomy. And aren't we grateful for a movement? Even we've seen transitions happen recently in our church where we deal with sin. Are you with me right here? Yeah. And so we're protected even in a worldwide movement from the top person all the way down. Are you with me right here? Where everyone understands we are under the word of God. And so Paul now writes to the church in Rome in Romans chapter 12, verse 4. It says, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ... We, though many, form one body, and each of the members belongs to all the others. Amen. Yes. And that was beautifully shared in our communion today. Amen. But this passage, it says, how many churches are there? One. Once again, in, in, in the church in Rome, there was only one church. So in our church, we practice planting only one church in each city. And the church in Ephesus and the church in Rome, they viewed themselves as one united church. Amen. Well, of course, 1 Corinthians 12, we read earlier, I'm not going to go to it again, but it says that we were baptized into the one body. So even in Corinth, once again, he emphasizes there was one church. So in the Bible times, there was only one church. Today, there's all kinds of different factions of different groups teaching all kinds of things. So we've got to ask ourselves, is division of God or of Satan? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we see hints of some of the first divisions going on here in the church. And in chapter 1, verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? What was happening here? Well, we see in verse 10, the standard of unity in the church was intense. He says, united mind and thought. So that means that we all got to wear like the same color shirt at church next week, right? No, right? It's, it's talking about they were united mind and thought on the apostles and the prophets, on what the Bible taught. Yeah. You know, similar, uh, if you watch like the NFL, for example, and let's just pretend I'm from New England, you know, the, the, the uh, New Orleans Saints go up to New England to play the Patriots or something. When they arrive in New England and Boston area, are they like, man, how do you guys play football up here? Or what kind of rule, regulations and rules do you guys have here for the sport? No, anywhere the NFL is established, right. they have the same rule book. Come on. Yeah. Right. Now, it might be snowy there and hot over here and different temperatures and different playing styles and this sort of thing, depending on what the coach desired, but the rules are the same. And so the idea here is if we are restoring biblical Christianity, which is what the International Christian Church's plea is, it's that in every place we visit, we go, hey, let's go to Chicago. We want to go visit the church there. We go there, and we go in, and it's the same teaching and the same doctrine. It's not like, oh, they baptize babies here. Oh, they date non-Christians here. Oh, they, they do this or they do that. No, it's the same teaching wherever you go. Are you with me right here? And that's the conviction we need to have in the Bible. And understand, Satan will always try to divide the church. And you may live through a time where you see a faction or a group or things break off and you got to hold to the scriptures. Are you with me right here? And God willing, that's not something we have to experience, but some of us have experienced it before. And the danger here is that people started following personalities. Most likely, people go, well, I follow Paul. Why? Because Paul planted the church. There's always kind of this loyalty, right, to like the guy that started the thing, right? And, and then you have another group that goes, I follow Apollos. And Apollos, he was the eloquent speaker. I imagine he was very charismatic. Like, man, we really like this guy, you know. Uh, I want to be part of that preacher's church. And then you have, of course, Peter, or as known as Cephas as well, who was the leader of the first century movement. And so you go, oh, dude, we want that guy to lead us, right? And you had one group that was just prideful. They go, we don't need any leadership. We just follow Christ, you know what I mean? That's how the language reads. It's like a negative thing. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and Paul's going, listen. Guys, you're so focused on people and men. And when you came to the gospel, it's just about getting saved, amen? But now these conflicts have started coming. And division is satanic when we start following men above God. Go to Matthew 15. It gets even more dangerous if it goes to this place. And Matthew 15, and of course, we read this, this whole passage in the word study, so we're just going to kind of jump in the middle of it here. 
um, for the sake of what we're doing today. But in Matthew 15, the Bible says in verse 6, Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. I like the other translations. They're following the, the doctrines of men. Wow. And so traditions not based in scripture, when followed, a man's teaching, this division becomes sinful. So again, if you're visiting with us, our goal is not to offend anyone. I always say, hey, if you get offended in church, study it out. Yeah. It's yeah. meant to get you to dig into the scriptures and find out why you believe what you believe. That's right. But you know, you've got whole groups like the Lutheran church that took uh, a heroic guy named Martin Luther who really took a stand for some Christian fundamentals, but later took some of his false ideas about the Bible and crystallized them, and now you have a whole group, the Lutheran church, that practices infant baptism, saved by faith alone, no discipleship. And so understand that this is how denominations go. Yeah. A lot of the founders start off with good intentions. You've got the Wesley brothers who started the Methodist church. Of course, you've got uh, more obvious ones like the Book of Mormon, you know, Joseph Smith, uh, and these types of groups. We want to be part of whose church, brothers and sisters? Right. Jesus's. And, and so we got to figure out, okay, what's the doctrine of Jesus then? And when we figure out what the doctrine of Jesus is, then we can know what church we need to be a part of. Amen? Amen. So we got to have a deep conviction. Can we worship in spirit and truth in groups that teach false teaching? No. no. And oftentimes, guys, counterfeit bills look real because a little bit's changed. And Satan's not some dummy where he's going to make some false church just, you know, I mean, worshiping Satan and having orgies and doing all this. And you're like, well, that's obviously wrong. No, he's going to try to dupe you in this room by groups that have a lot right and teach about a lot right about Jesus, but maybe something's a little different about what they believe about baptism or what they believe about the Holy Spirit. And it's that counterfeit bill that fakes you out. And you go, well, no, my mom's a nice person, and I want to go there, and I want to worship and stuff. And you're practicing in demonic worship wow. because it's a division that, 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 that God didn't, didn't intend for. I'm not talking about going with your mom on a Christmas you know, play at church or something like that. I'm saying if you're getting faked out to think this is the real truth, and so for us, we got to protect ourselves. I've seen so many new Christians get duped out by going and worshiping in other places because they're not strong in what the Bible teaches. And they don't understand that we're under authority of pastors or what we call shepherds. We're under authority. We are part of a family. And in America, we're built off independence. We just kind of, oh, I'm just going to do my own. It's just my personal relationship with God. And you know, that language was never found anywhere in the New Testament. God always had a covenant community with people. We get messed up. We read you in English and y, y O U, and we think it's talking to like, oh, that's talking to me. Yeah. And it's like, no, it's plural, dude, in the Greek yeah. most times. Yeah. He's talking to the church. Yeah. He's talking to the family. Now, I believe just like in any family, each sibling can have a, a special relationship with their father, but you got to be part of the family to do that. Come on. And you got to be committed to the family. Are you with me right here? All right. Let me not get too off track here. Let's go to Luke chapter 12 here. Luke chapter 12, Go, and we're going to look in Luke 12 and verse 51, and th consider, is there ever a time that division's good and godly? And I remember one of the first, when I read the scripture initially, I was being kind of shocked by it, and even a little confused uh, when I was really young. In Luke 12 and verse 51, it says, do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. <laughs> From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two, and two against three. They'll be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. Well, that wouldn't be a good Mother's Day right there, would it? <laughs> Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. No. What's happening here? He goes, Jesus goes, I came to bring division. And you're like, no, I thought he came to bring peace, right? The whole Christmas story, you know, peace on earth and all this. Guys, he came to bring peace between us and God. That's why he is called the Prince of Peace. But he's saying there's a chance that your human relationships, there's going to be division because you are now taking a stand for the truth. Maybe your family held to a certain tradition for generations, and then one, son, one, of, the son, one of the sons in the family decides to study the Bible and become a disciple and then has to give up that tradition. And now what they're saying is that their family's lost. And that causes an incredible amount of, of stress and intensity. And I think one of the things we have to be comfortable with as Christians is controversy. 
Uh, we live in a time where people say anytime there's any kind of conflict or something, it's totally wrong or it lacks love, and that is not the biblical message. And you don't love your family by compromising what the Bible teaches. That actually hurts them because now they see a fake Christian. They think they're saved. They think they're right because you don't have the guts to really share your faith with them. Are you with me right here? Now, on the other side, sometimes we, we have zeal without knowledge. And we get baptized, go back and tell our family, I think you're going to hell. You're not Christian. You need to believe this. You won't believe what I studied. This whole trip. Blah, 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 blah. And it's like, dude, shut up. And just walk with Jesus for three years first. And learn how to use tact and godliness so that you can really share with your family. And the best way you can share with your family initially is by just simply inviting them to church. Being a great example at home so that they see a difference and go, what is this guy a part of? You know, something's different in their life. Amen. That's the way to do it. But understand there will be division. There's going to be division and you have to be comfortable with it. Look in John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and verse 19. The Bible says in John 10 and verse 19. You know, for me, I, I, I was grateful um, so much for my parents giving me a foundation of faith. Amen. And my dad taught me very young the Ten Commandments. Uh, he came from a Seventh-day Adventist-type background. My mom, coming from a Methodist background, uh, taught us to love God. And I'm grateful for that foundation. I really want to honor all the parents here, even those that are visiting that may not be members of our church, because, because of what you've taught your children, um, their lives are forever changed. And, and, and they're now going to heaven, and I believe you were part of helping them be made into a disciple of Jesus Christ, amen? amen. And so it's always, I always like to honor those that don't cause the division, amen, <laughs> and support the decision, because that support that you give your son or your daughter in their spiritual walk has an eternal difference made in their lives, amen? amen. You know, in John 10 and verse 19, the Bible says, the Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he's demon-possessed and raving mad, and why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So again, Jesus had just got done preaching a, a great lesson on how he's the good shepherd and how he wants to bring the Gentiles into his fold. And they're like, the Jews are like, whoa, what, what, what are you talking about here? And his message, the Bible says, divides them. And Jesus' message is always polarizing. Jesus, when he preaches, no one ever walks away from Jesus' message going, hmm, let me pray about that for a little bit. Let me think about that. Or maybe I'll come back next week. No, they either wanted to kill the guy or they were like, we want to follow. And we need to understand if we are being like Jesus and we're a church that's like Jesus, people are going to come to our services. They're going to come around our church. They're going to study their Bible and they're either going to love it and want to become a disciple or they're going to want to hate it and maybe even persecute at times. Those are the options. And so all throughout Christian history, there's been noble stands for the truth that have gotten closer to the truth and divisions that have been ungodly. Yeah. The church started in Acts chapter 2. It started in 29 AD is probably the most accurate date, the traditional date, 33 AD. And for the first century, it just, it just grew rapidly and expanded all throughout uh, the Roman Empire. And they experienced uh, potential threats of division in the church over, you know, usually Jewish matters and stuff. But really, it was like the third century and fourth century that you really start to get some of the big false doctrines and the branches of Christendom that we know today. Of course, Constantine comes and uh, claims he has a vision where he's inspired to become someone who supports Christianity, and he legalizes it, and he wouldn't be baptized until his deathbed, but legalizes Christianity to be openly practiced, and now for the first time, you didn't have the threat of persecution. Literally, at one of his first councils he held, he had the church leaders come, and some of them had, like, eye patches on and things because they literally had been thrown to uh, uh, the lions in the um, uh, Colosseums there and stuff like that. But now they're, like, being treated like kings. And I believe a weakness came into the church at this point without the threat of persecution because now things were comfortable. The church has always thrived when it's persecuted throughout history. Why? Because the strong people become disciples. The, 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 the strong people. Now, we're all weak. You understand from a spiritual yeah. perspective. But you get what I'm saying. The courageous to make a decision to have a relationship with Jesus. And so the church was composed of sold-out disciples. And yet now it was not anymore. Wow. And now political influences started to come into the church. And there's debate on whether Constantine was sincere in his faith or whether it was some, a political move. We won't know. But at the end of the day, his goal was to unite the empire using Christendom and Christianity. 
Well, so in 364 AD, we see there's a split. The Roman Empire splits into two parts, and of course, this division leads to a division in Christianity. The eastern part becomes the Orthodox Church, and the western part becomes the Roman Catholic Church, and they have division over different practices, such as iconary in the church, and whether they have paintings or statues and this sort of thing, um, over whether the priests can be married or not. And then by the time you get to uh, 1054 uh, AD, there's what's known as the Great Schism. And this was the fifth Great Schism, and they basically excommunicate each other, saying, you guys aren't Christians, and you aren't Christians. And it's a pretty dramatic tale, if you ever want to read this story. It's, it's, it's a really fun read. It'd make a great movie. But in the 1500s, of course, you have Martin Luther who comes and begins the Reformation movement. And Martin Luther takes a stand against Roman Catholic, the, the Catholic Church on, on certain biblical convictions. He goes, number one, the Bible needs to have authority, not the church, amen? amen. The church is built on the Bible. And, and at that point in time, they got it around, mixed around. They were teaching apostolic succession and the Pope and the church was the one that made doctrine. And the Bible is just kind of an inspired work that you studied to be closer to God. Well, he's like, no, the Bible is the foundation, amen? And salvation's by faith, not by works. We believe that, that you can't earn or merit your way to heaven, amen? And that all Christians are priests. There's not this clergy lady division that it existed, but all of us are equal before the foot of the cross and all need to be disciples of Jesus. Sadly, he still baptized infants, but it created a great protest against the Catholic traditions at the time and started this revolution, the Protestant Reformation, amen? He still baptized infants, um, and if you ever get a chance to read the, the, the 95 theses that, that Martin Luther writes, you're going to find it's still very Catholic. It's honestly very Catholic. And so there were a lot of bad practices still. Of course, other noted reformers were John Calvin. This is where the Presbyterian Church would come from. Eurek Zwingli, um, the Reformed Church, as well as Conrad Gabriel, the Anabaptist. And the Anabaptists were unique because they actually tried to restore and taught adult baptism, amen? For, and, and they practiced forms of discipleship, but then both the Catholics and the Protestants persecuted them. And in some cases, they drowned them because they go, oh, you want to practice baptism? We'll show you baptism. They drowned them. And so true Christians are always persecuted. Sadly, they cowered in fear and eventually would become a group that kind of, you know, went and hid in the mountains. And we know them today as like the Mennonites and the Amish and these types of groups. But that was the, the Anabaptists. Many of them were probably our brothers and sisters that took a stand uh, for the faith. Of course, Henry VIII, uh, who leads the Church of England, um, was a very wicked man. Um, and, or, sorry, who, who is in England, was a very wicked man, and he wants to divorce his wife. Of course, divorce was a no-no in the Catholic Church, amen? They have a conviction about that, amen? <laughs> uh, we have a conviction, God hates divorce, amen, brothers and sisters? Amen. But, but, but he goes, oh, well, I want to divorce my wife. They won't let him, so he just starts his own church, amen? The Church of England, and the Church of England then, when America started, uh, would become the Episcopalian Church, because they didn't want to bear the uh, English name there, Amen. In the 1700s, you have the Great Awakening Movement, where John and Charles Wesley divide from the Church of England. And up until this point, guys, you got to understand that to be a Christian meant you were, you, you were practiced like a state religion. And so the, either it was the Catholic, you were born a Catholic, or you were born an Orthodox, or you were born a, a member of the Church of England. And so these were like literal, literally state religions. Well, with America's founding of freedom, people started to practice religious liberty and religious freedom. And John and Charles Wesley were fiery preachers that divide over the church of, from the Church of England over these issues. They started teaching that, you know what, if you're going to be a Christian, you're not born a Christian. You need to make a personal, transforming decision that's seen in the way you live your life to become a Christian. Amen? And they had high accountability of the members. They started practicing accountability. Amen? What we might call discipleship. And they started saying, we got to preach to those who don't go to church. we got to preach to the unchurch. But sadly, they continued to practice infant baptism. And even to this day, the Methodist church is super divided and is even allowing homosexual ministers at their pulpits. So once again, a drifting. Well, 1800s is where we kind of get into our roots here. Alexander Campbell, his father, Thomas Campbell, come from Scotland. And they, they take a stand against both Catholic and Protestant doctrines of salvation because they see in the Bible that the Bible teaches that you need to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And this basically condemned those who practice infant baptism, the Catholics, and those who practice the Protestant form being saved by faith alone. Because they go, well, you got to repent, you got to be baptized. So what started as a unity movement became one of the most divisive, <laughs> but in a good way because they were teaching the truth of how to become a disciple. Amen. 
Sadly, in reaction to Catholicism, their churches were all autonomous. So you could have, even in like Nashville today, there's like hundreds of churches of Christ. And this became what was known as the Church of Christ. And the Church of Christ uh, had this saying that the way you got to read the Bible is if the Bible speaks, we speak. If the Bible's silent, we're silent. Meaning, if the Bible gives us authority to do something, we can do it. But if it's silent, then it's forbidden. And so to this day, they won't use musical instruments. In a church of Christ, though they teach the same plan of salvation we teach, that would be considered sin right there, that guitar. And they'd kick you out. You say, why? Wow. Because there's no example in the New Testament of ever using instruments wow. to worship. There's not. You go, well, what about the Old Testament? Well, remember, they claim they're a New Testament-only church. Because, of course, we don't, we don't practice the Old Testament, although we understand we're a Bible church, and that the Old Testament is just as inspired as the New, amen? Yeah. And though the Mosaic Law has been nailed to the cross, we don't, you know, sacrifice animals and this sort of thing, we understand that that was the Bible for the early church. Yeah. So understand that this created a very legalistic movement where sometimes they believed, oh, we got to take communion using one cup and pass it around because Jesus used one cup. You know, when plagues would happen, that probably wasn't a very inspiring idea. <laughs> but that's what, what happened. And so this created a, a lot of lukewarmness. And then there was a new movement that started in 1967 within the Churches of Christ called the Crossroads Movement or the Total Commitment Movement. And this was initiated by uh, Chuck Lucas, who basically took some ideas from, um, you know, secular groups like Campus Crusade for Christ that were teaching false doctrine, but they were also still having a huge effect and impact on campuses like at UCLA where it started. And so he goes, what if we took the truth of God's word and imitated the idea of going on a campus and practicing small groups and preaching and discipleship? And what he restored really was that instead of just going and call, doing an altar call and saying, hey, if you want to repent and be baptized, come forward. He said, what if we studied the Bible with people and counted the cost with them? Made sure they understood the commitment they were getting into. And so it became known as like the total commitment movement. And so they started practicing this. Practicing this. Of course, uh, Kip McKean was baptized uh, into this group at the University of Florida. And as he grew older, he started seeing, man, the campus students are really fired up and sold out, but largely a lot of the marrieds and the adults aren't. The marrieds would be like smoking after church outside. It's one of his memories he talks about. And, and praise God, we're not like that, amen? We believe all ministries are sold out to God. But all the college students were on fire, and he goes, you know something? I really believe that the Bible if we're going to really restore biblical Christianity, that number one, we need to be a Bible church, not just a New Testament church. And so in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, we know it says all scriptures God breathed. Amen, brothers and sisters? But when he's writing that, had the New Testament been completed yet? So what's he referring to? The Old Testament. And so the Old Testament can be used to disciple, to correct, and it has principles in it and how to build a church and build God's kingdom. And he, Kip goes, you know, I don't believe to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible silence nonsense. He goes, I believe that you've got to speak where the Bible's silent and be silent where the Bible speaks. Meaning, if the Bible says something, we just got to shut up and obey it. Amen, brothers and sisters? Yeah. It's the word of God. But where it's silent, we have the freedom to have our own opinions and convictions on things. And leadership can implement methodologies and principles such as, hey, we meet for church at 10 a.m. Amen? Is there a thou shall meet at 10 a.m. in the Bible anywhere? No, but we speak where the Bible's silent for unity's sake and purpose. And this created a sense of unity and it actually unified many churches of Christ came and started joining uh, this, this crossroads movement. But Chuck Lucas eventually got into some, some wicked sins and was taken out of leadership. And so a lot of these people were left orphaned and Kip started formulating these convictions and it would become what we know as the Boston movement or the International Churches of Christ, amen? So in 1979, Kip meets together with 30 people. It started with the church of 60, but he preaches that you got to be totally committed, and it dwindles down to 30, amen? And, and now he has a sold-out base of disciples that believe that, one, they're a Bible church, two, they're going to speak where the Bible's silent, and three, that only baptized disciples compose God's church. Because Matthew 28 teaches that we go and make a disciple, baptize them, and then we stay with them and disciple them, Amen. And so he started restoring this idea that if we're going to have a church composed of only disciples, every person needs a discipleship partner. And then, of course, he said to those 30, or those 30 would come to believe 
uh, years later that God's plan was for autonomy of a local congregation. And again, anytime we see God's people unified, there was usually a central leader, whether it was Moses, Joshua, uh, David. But when there was no leader, what's it say? It says Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit because Jesus wants to be our king. Amen? Amen. And he always worked through a human representative. You know, we understand this in the world. Every football team needs a quarterback, a business, a CEO. Someone's got to make the final decision. Are you with me right here? And so we don't believe this central leader is a pope or has authority, you know, to hear a voice from God and all this stuff. He's a disciple like you and I that's leading the way spiritually. And we're excited for Raul Marino, who just became our central leader here in, the new, in our movement of God. Amen. And, and, and that central leader just simply helps guide God's people in the missionary work that we have. You know, the churches aren't to be autonomous, but to work together. And this went against the mainline Church of Christ thinking at the time. You know, eventually uh, God's will became very clear with these 30 that God wants to see the world evangelized in our generation. You say, well, how do we know that? Well, Matthew 28, he commissioned the 11 to go to where? All nations. all nations. When's the only time those 11 could go to all nations? In their lifetime, amen? You know, if you tell your kid, hey, I need you to make your bed, you don't mean three weeks from now. You mean in this generation, Amen. Delayed obedience is, is disobedience to God. And so that's why we feel the pressure and the heat to get the world evangelized because we want to be obedient to our Lord so that all men can come to a knowledge of the truth. You know, sadly, the movement then departed back to a mainline Church of Christ theology in around 2002. And each congregation became locally autonomous again. Even though this church had grown all throughout the world, they had planted almost 400 churches in every nation that had a city of at least 100,000. And then after that, the leadership departed back from the foundational principles and thousands fell away around the world, guys. And so in 2006, in Portland, Oregon, Kip moved there and started preaching those original convictions we held to and God birthed the sold out movement or the international Christian churches we're a part of because we held on to those five core convictions. Bible church, we speak where the Bible's silent, amen. Yeah, you can clap for that, praise God, amen. Uh, three, that disciple, we're a church composed of only disciples. Uh, four, that we're to evangelize the world and our generation, that we need a leader to do this, amen, a central leader to help keep everyone unified. So what's the one church? When you talk about there's one body, what's the one church today? Let's go to Acts chapter 11, amen. Acts chapter 11. Again, there's so much I could say on the history. I encourage you, if you get a chance, you want to know more about our history, there's really three books I would buy that are really good. Uh, Kip's own writing, Revolution Through Restoration, is a powerful book that I encourage you to read um, that goes through from his own heart how God kind of helped him come to a lot of these convictions and principles. Uh, two is uh, Ron Harding's book, A Chronicles of Modern Day uh, Christianity, uh, goes through the history of our church. And once again, it's another incredible read. And this is not me trying to tout you that you need to buy my book or anything like that. But my book, if you read yes. chapter one, yes. uh, chapter one gives a really great history of the movement, not just campus ministry, but it, it's very succinct. And uh, it, it was awesome. And I helped interview Kip for that part of the book. And it was really awesome uh, for me to learn a lot of the stuff I learned. So, so please uh, take time to know your history, because if you don't know your history, you don't know who you are. All right, in Acts chapter 11 and verse 25, it says, Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Well, once again, we see this word church here used. It says Barnabas and Saul met with the church. And what were the people in the church called, brothers and sisters? Disciples. Or what else? Christians, right? And so we know a disciple equals a Christian equals someone who's saved, going to heaven, but in a very real way, the church equals the disciples, plural, equals the Christians, plural, amen? And the word church is ekklesia in the Greek, and it means an assembly or a congregation of those who have been called out of the world. And so when we talk about what's the one church, you got to pretend you're God for a moment, and look, you're looking down at the earth, and you want to see your church. You're going to see people that are only what? Only baptized disciples, amen? Only disciples, only Christians. And that's what we call the church universal. There might be another group meeting down the street that teaches the same plan of salvation, that you need to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. 
And God would see us as one church universal from a spiritual perspective. Are you with me right here? Yeah. Of course, what's God's heart? What's he desire? Well, he desires unity and oneness. Are you with me right here? God always had Israel, his nation. There was a time Israel was divided. And that wasn't what God wanted, but there were faithful people in Israel and Judah. But God, in a corporate sense, was with which one? Judah, thank you. And so, guys, you know, anyone read the Old Testament out there, dude? Okay, all right, all right. We got me a little scared here, amen. Um, God was with Judah. As the Bible says, there have to be differences among us to show which of us has God's approval. And, and so understand that, that the church universal is comprised of all those who are true Christians who God sees. What we're trying to build is what scholars call the visible church. For us, that's our local congregation. That would be the international Christian church. And so if we're to build the international Christian church, we need to build a church of people that are only what? Right. Only disciples. That's right. And that's what makes our church unique, is that everyone that comes to our church is called from the pulpit and through discipling relationships to be obedient to the Bible. Doesn't mean we're perfect or we don't have sins or things like that, but there's a standard, an expectation of obedience. So does the international Christian church believe they're the only ones going to heaven? No, not at all. In fact, we don't believe we're the only Christians in this city of Riverside here right now, right? But what makes us unique is that not that we, we don't believe we're the only disciples, but we believe we're the only church that's composed of only disciples. That's what makes us unique. And from our research and study, there's no church that teaches these same core convictions that I think God has graciously revealed to us that are really not so much issues of salvation, rather issues of proclamation and how we're going to accomplish God's will on this earth. Are you with me right here? And so it's important to understand we need to be a part of a church that's composed of disciples. And so we talk through people when we study the Bible through this. Hey, if you're going back home for the summer and you're a college student, what should you check to make sure is there? A church that, that teaches the truth. And I go even further. I say, you need to be a part of the International Christian Church. Right. Not because I think there's no safe people in that city, but because we're family, amen? amen? And we know what each other teaches, and we know the doctrine, and we know uh, there's no confusion on what's being taught. And, and there's a great transfer that happens when moving from place to place. Would it be God's will for someone to go back and live or take a job in a place where there's no church? No. no. In fact, in Acts 2... The only place there was a church for the first eight to ten years of Christianity was Jerusalem. And those people never went back that had sold. That's why they had to sell their stuff to, like, help the members. Because yeah. they had to stay committed to the church. Wow. And yet for some of us, we have a hard time driving to Orange County just to go to church. You know, I really respect. I love the Coachella Valley region. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Uh, to me, these are some of the most sold out disciples. Because yeah, I, I never, Scott saying never complained to me about anything. I don't hear any complaints about the drive. Some of these students come every Friday to our Devo yeah. and stuff. Because we understand, as Lou Jack would say, a church alive is worth the drive. Amen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Amen. You know, so let's, let's make sure, and we understand the church. There's several names in the Bible for God's church, uh, disciples, Christians, Church of Christ, and Romans 16, 16, all kinds of things. Uh, we've chosen the name Christians from Acts uh, 11 there, um, and since we're an international church, we've gone international Christian church. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Pretty simple. Uh, that's the name. Well, let's kind of come for a landing here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12. Trying to hurry. I promised Joe I'd be done by 1230, so I'm, 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 going, I'm going for it, bro. He's sitting right in the front row here, so I'm, I'm a little nervous. All right, Acts chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 here in verse 14. Um, the Bible says here in verse 14, oh, I'm in Acts. I'm like, that looks really different. Okay. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14. So we already read that when you're baptized, you're added to form one body. And in verse 15, it says, or verse 14, each, even so, the body's not made up of one part, but of many. But if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body and every one of them just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. 
On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part's honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And the church said, amen. amen. Bottom line, he goes, you got to be an active member of the body. Yeah. And on. he says here that, that I can't say the hand, I don't need you. If I was to chop off my hand with an axe and it started like bleeding out and kind of flinching around here on the pulpit, what's going to happen to that hand eventually? It's going to die. So if you remove yourself from being an active part of the body of Christ, what happens to you spiritually? You die. We call this falling away or apostasy, but like leaving the truth of God and walking away from the body of Christ is to walk away from Christ because this is where our life source is. Even earlier, he says you drink from the spirit of God in the body of Christ. And what's amazing about this is the Bible says that every member is important. You know, sometimes in the church we go, oh, being a leader is important and being an ICCM or being in the ministry. Those are like the fundamental gifts or something like that. Well, if everybody was doing that, we'd all be in trouble because there would be like no one, no way to support the church because everyone would be broke. Amen. And we definitely wouldn't be evangelized in the world. Every member's gifts are important. And here's the thing. You don't need an official role given by myself or someone to use your gifts for God. Some people go, well, I would be an active member if they noticed what I do, you know, or whatever. <laughs> well, what's stopping you from using that gift now? And, and, and some of us are new. We're still trying to find our place in the church. That's totally fine. But you know who's really special in the church that's supposed to be lifted up? The Bible says is the weaker members. And we understand that, you know. If, if you get a mark on your face or something, you, you want some makeup, right? I'll never forget one time flying on an airplane. And I always fall asleep leaning forward like this. I don't know why I can't sleep like back on the seat. But like my head kept on bumping and rubbing against the, 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 the you know, uh, seat in front of me. And it got like a little burn. And it literally looked like I was Hindu or something. Like, like when I looked in the mirror, like I was just like, oh, wow, this is not good. And I felt like embarrassed by it. But my wife pulled out some makeup, amen, and, and put on some makeup on there. And all of a sudden it was gone. And I was like, amen, you know. See, the weaker part was treated with special modesty, amen? <laughs> and, and so why do we have the, the weaker parts in the body? It, it, it keeps us compassionate, yes, keeps us loving, yes, and, and, and understand they're indispensable. You know, if someone's missing from church right now, if someone missed, we had 18 people in Riverside miss women's midweek. Yeah. Wow. I was shocked. I'd never seen that in, like, forever. Wow. You go, what? These are weak people. Yeah. And I'm sorry if you were one of them. But, but, but you got to get strong. Now, I'm not talking about someone's physically sick or, you know, uh, if you have COVID, please, you know what I'm saying? Like, 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 don't, I'm not talking about those situations. I'm talking about someone who's just spiritually weak and was overwhelmed, just didn't feel like coming. And so what do we need? These people need special care. And so we need to have a heart for our brother and sister as Cain and, you know, said, said as God said to Cain, you know, or what, what did he say? You're, am I my brother's keeper is what Cain said, right? And, and, and the answer is yes, we are a brother's keeper. And so we need to be active. We need to show empathy in the church. It says where one part suffers, we all suffer. So we need to be able to suffer with our brothers and sisters when they're going through hard times and sit with them and listen to them and not come across judgmental just because maybe we're not having a, a, a tough time in that particular area. Amen. We need to be able to rejoice with others' victories, though it may not be things you're really into or something like that. You're like, man, they're excited. I'm going to be excited too. Amen. You know what I mean? That's what we got to have. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 10 here. And we're going to close talking about contribution. So don't, don't worry. There's no contribution part of the service here. This will be it. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, Come on, Mike. the Bible says in Hebrews 10 and verse 23, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promises is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. You know, the Bible commands us. We got to hold unswervingly to our faith. You ever driven with like a swervy driver? And, and, and maybe your spouse is like that or something, right? And you're just like freaked out. Mine's not, but I'm saying maybe you're just like freaked out, you know what I mean? And there's just anxiety, right? 
That's how it feels being around a swervy Christian. You know, you ever, Bible talk leaders ever had swervy Christians in your group, and you're just like, man, I'm just trying to plan an event, and I just can't even, nothing, you know, it's just scary, right? You don't know which way they're going to go. Um, the Bible says you've got to hold unswervingly to your faith and what you believe. How do you do that in verse 25? What are you commanded not to quit doing? Meeting together. In fact, I like other translations, says don't forsake the worship assembly. Christian Standard Bible, King James, you know, because the Bible commands us not to miss church. Now, here's the thing. It says not to get in the habit. So will there be times you have to go out of town or take a vacation with your family or whatever? Of course. But there should never be a habitual missing of a meeting of the body. So when we study the Bible with people in our church, we ask everyone that's getting committed to getting baptized that they need to commit to being at every meeting. We meet from Sunday mornings from 10 a.m., depending on how long I preach, um, whenever that ends. And then we do Wednesday night um, at 7.30. Uh, we usually get done by 9. And then, of course, we have, if you're a college student, we ask every college student to be a member of our college devotional on Friday night. And, you know, you may not know, it's actually purposeful that's Friday night because most college students are out destroying their lives on Friday night. Amen? <laughs> and so we figure we should build our lives on Friday night and have an awesome campus devotional. Of course, once a month, we try to have a singles devotional or a marrieds devotional. Um, we all part of a Bible talk where we're effectively reaching out to the lost in our community. Yeah. And again, we need to have a conviction. This is about six to eight hours of meetings a week on a week that you have midweek. Is that really too much time to ask for God? No, but we've been brainwashed by the world. Yeah. There are people that have missed church because they're sick, but then go to their job on Monday morning. Oh, Why? They value a paycheck more than they do God and their spiritual family. And listen, I'd rather be fired because I'm taking a stand for God than to be fired for eternity in hell for deciding to miss church forever. Are you with me right here? That's kind of my conviction about it, is that Jesus needs to come first. So you've got to work through people's schedules to really help them be effective in their walk with God. Now, as we talk about contributions, let's go to Malachi chapter 3 here. Go, my, Come on. Malachi chapter 3. Oh, man, Joe, I've got three minutes. Okay, all right. Malachi chapter 3. I'm just kidding, bro. In, in, in chapter 3 and verse 6, it says, uh, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I'll return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough for you to store it. I'll prevent fests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your field will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Amen. You know, here in the Old Testament, they had rebuilt the temple. They'd started making sacrifices to God again, but God's presence wasn't there. And they go, God, what's going on? And God goes, will you return to me? And they're like, we want to return to you. But he goes, how do we return to you? And he goes, well, you need to stop robbing me, amen? And they're like, well, how are we robbing you? And they go, well, in tithes and offerings. And so in the Old Testament, it was required that you'd give a tithe, meaning 10% of your different crops and the different things you grew and your income at that time. And then they had offerings, like free will offerings. It really parallels in a lot of ways. The tithe might be like your weekly contribution and an offering might be like your special missions contribution. Are you with me right here? Yeah. But the principle we find, though I don't believe tithing is a binding law on the church. Some people do. That's okay. I, 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 that's a whole other thing. I, I see in this pr principles of sacrifice that God views it when we don't give to him, he views it as robbing him. Wow. Now, if I told you that Joe robbed a bank last night, and he, he comes in, and he, he, you know, he's like, well, I'm sorry, I should, probably shouldn't have done that, and just continues on with life. You're, you're going to be like, dude, that's a big deal. He went into Bank in America and held them up and took their money and just was like, yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that. No. But if I told you Joe didn't give his contribution, for a lot of you, you'd be like, eh, that's between him and God. Oh. But what's worse, to rob God or rob a bank? Oh, my Robbing a bank. It's not as bad as, is, is, is uh, not as even comparable to robbing God. Right. And so the principle is, is that the money would be used in the Old Testament to help the worship of God and to help the priests support themselves. 
Similarly, in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 9, 14, the Bible says those who preach the gospel should earn their living from the gospel. And so we invest our money, obviously, not in buildings. I know it's frustrating sometimes to find parking here and walk all the way and all this kind of stuff. But amen, don't we invest our money in people? Yeah. And so we invest it in full-time preachers so that the gospel can get out, and mercy worldwide so we can meet the needs of those who are hurting or sick or poor in our community. And many of us have benefited from benevolence in the church when we needed help at times. And so it's good to talk through someone at this point in the study on what our money goes to. And so the New Testament doesn't command a tithe. It commands generosity. And let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. To me, a tithe, that's Old Testament stuff. That's just like the, 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 the beginning, the floor. It's not the ceiling. And as you grow as a Christian, you should grow more from a tithe. Come on. Now, in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6, the Bible says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God's able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you'll abound in every good work. Amen. Amen. Well, this is a beautiful passage because the Bible teaches that our giving should be done with a cheerful heart. Yeah. The Greek word's like hilarious, yo. It's, it's, it's like you're just so happy. You're so cheerful. It's sacrificial. Amen. And I won't, you know, do my laugh today for you guys. But, but, but it, it's when you give to God, there's just like a sacrificial heart that, that you go, man, I'm just, I'm just happy. I know this is going to be used to God's glory. God does not want you to give under compulsion. And so it's on each individual Christian's responsibility to make sure that their heart's right before God. The preachers, as preachers, we're actually commanded to command people to give. We're actually commanded to put the pressure on the church to be sacrificial. But it's up to each individual Christian not to go, oh, he's making me give under compulsion. No one can do that. No one's holding a gun to your head, right? Like, but it's up to each individual Christian to go, man, I really love God's work. I love God's ministry. I love the fact that I'm saved and that Jesus died for me. So out of response and grace, I've decided to give something. And I love how he says, give what you decided to give. And so we ask every person that gets baptized to make a decision of a pledged amount that they're going to give weekly to God. And you can always change that if you want. Um, but this is where the church bases its budget off of so that we can determine how we're going to do our missions, how we're going to continue to support our staff. I mean, guys, don't we want to put on more interns in our regions? Yes. Right now, we've grown so much. Now we're past 200, but we don't have any full-time interns. The one we do is, 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 is going to be leaving soon. That's Brandon, right? Wow. And so, so understand that, that, that we want to put more people on staff. Amen? And, and this comes at a great sacrifice. And so the church is God's glorious body of Christ. And as we consider our contribution today, we're going to pray here in a moment. But I just want you to think about, for me, just going through this study again, doesn't it just make you grateful for the church? And you're just like, wow, what a great plan of God. And let's show God how much we love him and honor him by giving our special missions and our weekly contribution. Amen? Let's pray. Amen. Father, thank you so much for today, God. Thank you for this uh, study that we got to go over. Uh, Lord, I really pray that as we give to you today, God, it will be from a heart that wants to please you. Uh, sometimes, God, we know it's hard, God, but Lord, I pray that, Father, we can stick to what we've vowed to you and what we've committed. Lord, uh, please bless your work. I pray for all the moms today that they feel honored and just thank you for this special Mother's Day service and thank you for the Jerusalem that's free from above that's been a mother to us all. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.